Season 1 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley, Daniel Murphy, and Douglas Dollars, who reminds you to be present, be loving, and that life moves really fast. describe the neighborhood we're sitting in right now or the sub neighborhood or the part of this neighborhood what what where are we we're we're in silver lake it and before this area was silver lake it was ivanhoe and i don't think ivanhoe existed as a separate neighborhood that long it was I i believe ivanhoe was founded in the 1890s by a scottish immigrant who supposedly thought this area reminded him of scotland i mean i don't know like I've never been to Scotland, but... Um, Why not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd love to. Just money. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, I, I don't think Scotland's known for the chaparral climate. And, yeah. It, but that was before the Silver Lake Reservoir was put in. I think the Silver Lake Reservoir construction started around 1905 or so. So it had a relatively short existence as Ivanhoe and then Silver Lake. And it's also... They all kind of merged. I mean, it was Edendale, too, was established over what in what's now the Silver Lake Echo Park border. And, that was and the namesake of the bar we sit in right now. That is, it is the namesake. I'm not sure if this area was actually considered part of Edendale, but I don't think people were that concerned about deciding particularly what neighborhood boundaries were. I mean, there's still not really that much in L.A. Right. You know, it's still open to debate. It's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall. Listeners, allow me to introduce you to Eric Brightwell, who does a number of things. First and foremost, at least for the purposes of this program, he uh, is the he flies under the banner of Pendersley and Sons Cartography. And, and under that banner, he hand-draws maps of Los Angeles's countless neighborhoods with uh, their disputed borders and their many hidden features and their sometimes unknown qualities, often unknown qualities, to those who don't live or work in them here in Los Angeles. And he is also the proprietor of Brightwell here in Silver Lake, which offers to the discerning... To the discerning, what is it, uh, cosmopolitan gentleman, nice luxury idea. and craft <laughs> goods. Yes, yeah. indeed. So uh, a man of multiple talents here, but he knows the neighborhoods more than many do. And let me ask you this. I mean, so how, how to describe Silver Lake to somebody who's not set foot in Los Angeles? I don't think they would even, I don't think they would have an image of Silver Lake if they were, say, from across the country and they knew Los Angeles from movies. Right. Well, I mean, they've, they've tried to make a few... TV show set in Silver Lake, and I feel like they're, they're, they're kind of... Which ones have tried that? There, I think there was an Aaron Spelling show that was... If I remember the details correctly, it was about a, a psychic record store owner, uh, and, and I think he could communicate with pets or something. I'm not making this up. Sounds like an early 80s type thing? No, or? this was like a few shortly before he died. Oh. And then there was another show that changed names. It only ran like eight episodes, and it was called like it, it was definitely going for a sex lies and videotape thing. But it was called like Sex Scandal and Love. And then they changed the name to something else. Uh, yeah, it was kind of like a Melrose Place type thing. And it kind of I think that a lot of people that live here in LA and don't live here kind of think of Silver Lake as like hipster central and uh the williamsburg of the west uh i've heard Port- portland of los angeles yeah, as well okay i could see that there i mean you know you see handlebar mustaches and terry cloth shorts on guys and things like that but the density of american apparel billboards yeah, is yeah, a little heavier yeah, here. yeah it's they're definitely they're definitely you know there definitely is the hipster element and that um but it's it's from what 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 I've always experienced and, and seen, it's still very. It's much more diverse than that. There, there's a large gay population. Uh, I hear it used to be bigger. I've heard it, complaints. I I feel like I don't know if it used. To, I mean, I don't have since. I don't know if they take track, keep track of that in the census. Uh, but it it 
it, I know lots of gay people that live in Silver Lake, and there used to definitely be more gay bars, but I think that that's kind of assimilated in general, in L.A. at least. Uh, you don't have so many gay-specific bars, which, you know, is, I guess, good and bad. They're, the marginalization has kind of disappeared, but the separate culture has kind of disappeared too as things have run together but it's also very it's very latino and working class there's a large filipino population and a lot of that doesn't really get talked about in the media in in general i mean i I think asians and latinos in la are kind of marginalized by the media as i don't know they're, they're they're slightly less visible Um, even though they exist in larger, way larger numbers than you'd think. What is a Los Angeles neighborhood versus when people talk about neighborhoods in New York Mm -hmm. or even neighborhoods in Chicago or or smaller towns? Mm -hmm. What's different about what a neighborhood is and how people think about, how people approach neighborhoodness in Los Angeles? That's a little bit of a grand-sounding question, but it seems like neighborhoods are something different here, slightly, than elsewhere. I think so. I think it's, it's less concrete. People... People are passionate about what neighborhood they're from. They'll passionately argue that they live in one neighborhood versus another. And then this, you know, the city will tell them you live in this neighborhood. The LA Times will say you live in this neighborhood. They'll disagree. Um, and neighborhoods are constantly coming and going. I don't. I feel like in in some cities it's always, it's just so much more set in stone. There's no. If you're in. Harlem, you're not in Staten Island, and you can't start calling it Staten Island without everyone disagreeing with you. But here, like, people I, know where the boroughs are. Yeah, they, and they kind of know the boundaries, and and, and, and they're kind of set. And, you know, when I moved here, a lot of people that I knew that moved here thought of Silver Lake as the east side, but a lot of people that I've known here that are native Angelinos are like, no, the east side starts east of the river and and are not being smug about it. They're like, we would just never... And just yesterday I saw a, a gang tag in, in Echo Park and it was uh, a west side gang because they all represent west side that are west of the river. So, um, and there's no there's no consensus. I mean, right. Google Maps and everything are... are and are, they all have different definitions. Now that they're starting to draw borders on Google Maps... And the LA Times of the Mapping LA uh, project, none of them are consistent. The neighborhood councils don't agree with the any. It, it's all different. Yeah. You know what I find is a surprisingly good neighborhood map. Tell me your opinion as an yeah. official neighborhood mapper, uh, or one who's made himself official in a sense mm-hmm. in the way that, in the minds of many an Angelino. Yeah. The 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 bus and rail combined map in the subway stations. You've seen that thing, which has neighborhood maps. It's like I always point it out to friends as if you want to see where a neighborhood is, look yeah. at that map. No one ever looks at that thing. The MTA has it. Yeah, they're in the subway stations. It's a bewildering, a bewildering diagram of every rail and bus line. So it's just like it, it looks like spaghetti. Okay. But the neighborhood names are everywhere, and it's it'd be a fascinating look. But well, it, it's true. Um, it, the, a lot of neighborhoods, like, if you look... I know they changed it recently. I think it was Yahoo Maps, which no one I know uses. But it was... They had so many neighborhoods with boundaries and stuff, and it was all named after... For the most part, it was based on um, uh, train stops, which a lot of the original... Like, Sunset Junction was Sanborn Junction, and then it became Sunset Junction. But this it is was, in the 30s and 20s and before so, with the Pacific yeah. Electric it, rail lines? Yeah, the, the Pacific Electric and... What was the other one? The Los Angeles? There were the yellow cars and the red cars. Yellow, yellow and red cars, right. often lamented, said to have shaped Los Angeles into the shape it is. Yeah. And... Uh, which many people, many people now drive on the old paths of it, but we're slowly rebuilding the train lines as well. Yeah, the Expo line just reopened two days ago. Got to ride that thing. Yeah. Have you ridden that thing? I wanted to. I uh, I was I thought about taking the day off from work just to do that, but it was also my brother's birthday. I hear it was crowded. <laughs> it, well, I went on the Gold Line extension the day that opened, and it was like forty five minutes to get on. I was going to write about it and get off at every stop and write about the area around the stops but when it took 45 minutes to just get in line it yeah it couldn't it didn't work excitement will die down but we brought up an issue that it's come up on this show before and people have said different things so maybe i should make this into a standard question you know where do you number one do you think of los angeles as being an east side and a west side or do you think of it more as east west central and where are those lines 
Well, I personally, and I've and I've kind of changed my opinion on where some of those lines are, but I, I think of it, it, I almost think of it as being like its own country. Uh, Southern California, I believe, or the Southland, it, it, or SoCal. I think SoCal is like the size of the Netherlands. Yes, yeah, bigger probably. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I'll draw maps and I'll start out on one scale, and then and then I'll find out someone else considers this part of that region, and it just expands and expands and expands. But I think uh, LA has an east side and a west side, and th- there there are regions within regions. I mean. Midtown includes Mid City, Mid Wilshire, Wilshire Center, Mid City West. There and those neighborhoods, those sub regions contain neighborhoods that some of them are officially defined and are incredibly small, like St. Andrews Square or Sycamore Square, and they'll get some kind of official designation. A lot of times people don't even know that they live in these new neighborhoods. You know, you'll you'll talk to somebody that lives in Manchester Square, and they're like, "I thought this was just South LA, or South Central, or the South LA West Side, or the East Side." But I I don't know. I think I tend to divide it up into about twelve regions or so. It's the San Fernando Valley because I try not to distinguish too much between the the LA County, the the city because LA also has unincorporated communities, cities neighborhoods and and sometimes the the distinction between them is it, it's on paper but like I, I I think Van Nuys is a neighborhood of LA and not its own city but maybe really I think it, but it could have been its own city before and then in a city like Hawaiian Gardens feels like a tiny 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 neighborhood of LA but it's its own city right so things- I, I, I use this example with friends like, okay, there's Hollywood. Mm-hmm. That's part of Los Angeles. West Hollywood is contiguous, but a right. different city. North Hollywood is Rip not away. contiguous. Uh, yeah. But who knows? I mean, it's, it's, I can see why people are confused yeah. is all I'm saying. It is confusing. I mean, Hollywood used to be its own town. And, the, and that's the story of a lot of L.A. County. I mean, there's been development in all directions except up, really. Uh, and, and that's coming. Yeah, and it is coming, and I, I kind of like it, but I don't like the whole idea of, oh, do we need to New Yorkify? You probably wouldn't <laughs> have Silver Lake filled with skyscrapers, right. ideally. Well, next door, they're building the tallest building on this street, and it's three stories. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's it's moving, you know, it's skyscrapers now. But, uh, yeah, th- things things incorporate, disincorporate, and, and I don't know if anything's incorporated, disincorporated, and incorporated again, but it seems really informal overall. Just the coming, a, a lot of them start as tracts, and you can look on, like, the county assessor's page and see, okay, this used to be this neighborhood. Like, Echo Park's a good example. You've got Angelino Heights. A lot of people think of Angelino Heights as part of Echo Park. Um, but it's got its own neighborhood designation signs. Elysian Heights used to be, I think, thought of, and, and, and still by a lot of people, as its own neighborhood, but it doesn't have its own signs, so if you don't include that in an Echo Park map, I think people will be annoyed. If you don't include historic Filipino town, people will argue with you, well, that's really Echo Park, and yet it has a history as a Filipino neighborhood and, and a distinct identity as far as I'm concerned um, and a lot of times freeways carve neighborhoods in LA and something that seems like it was connected to another neighborhood all of a sudden seems like it's separated by the Berlin Wall because there's a freeway cutting through it's the unintended Berlin Wall effect of the freeway building here I think so yeah I think that's happened in a lot of neighborhoods I mean Frogtown right here used to have a from what I, un, I understood it used to have a much uh, more distinct character but now, I think listeners would love to know what Frogtown is because I'm, I'm sure most of them are now thinking Frog Frogtown <laughs> is that like I mean France will come to mind yeah. unfairly <laughs> but what, what what is it it's an ethnic French enclave no <laughs> it's not it's uh, it's it's actually it's a mostly Chinese and Latino neighborhood that's adjacent barely to Silver Lake that got nicknamed Frogtown. It's, t- it's technically uh, Elysian Valley. And you've got Elysian Heights up above it and Elysian Park, our first big city park. And then uh, uh, Frogtown had an invasion of, I believe there were Western toads. They're definitely not frogs. But when, when the 
LA River was not all paved and flooding was at least happened sometimes they were overrun by uh, toads not frogs and then there was a gang that uh, the, the gang the local gang there is the frog town and they've been they've been uh, more vocal than most gangs with the stuff I've written about because I made the mistake of saying that their numbers had diminished since the 70s and that so you get an email like I'm a gang member I gotta, and I, I assure you our numbers are yeah. strong I got a lot of I got a lot of really angry all caps comments on the Frogtown blog about how strong they still are and how much they do for the neighborhood and stuff, uh, which, which seemed to come down to how much tagging is done. And because I, I suggested, and I don't want to piss people off again, but that when I went there, most of the tags I saw were Echo Park gang tags, and that uh, annoyed all the remaining Frogtown members apparently <laughs> however many there are now listeners you can if you haven't seen Eric's uh, Pendersley and Sons maps you can pull them up on Facebook or you can look on Amoeba Music's Amoeba blog you can find them there you know in, in smaller size versions you can buy the originals of course for those that haven't already been bought but it seems like you, you draw your maps and do all of them anger people as far as like, that's not the border. I don't live there. That's, I, I live in this time. You're, you, you put me in the wrong neighborhood. That's not how I think of it. Like, is, are there always these disputes that come up? I don't know. I kind of live in fear that there are always disputes. Um, and sometimes I, I, I come out of the gates being defensive and, and explaining why I consider this neighborhood to be, or, or this block to be part of this neighborhood, not that neighborhood. Um, but it's it's just for the most part people don't respond negatively. It's just I, I think it's just the nature of being self conscious and being on the internet and and you assume every time you see that there's a comment left on your page that it's someone that's angry, and racist, or a troll, or yeah. someone's tr- someone's trying to you know make you miserable for three days. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me, in the people are going to be thinking, in the age of Google Maps on all of our phones, I use it every trip I make. I'm pulling up Google Map on my phone to explore. Why? What, what do hand-drawn maps still give you personally, you know, especially if you're the one drawing them? Why, why still draw a map? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, to me, like, some of them started as kind of a practical thing because when I first started to look for neighborhood maps. Well, I had no sense of where I was a lot of times in L.A. I, you know, I was... You do, I think. Yeah. I would be riding passenger seat with my ex, and, and we'd be going through Santa Fe Springs or something, and I would... Even if I knew that we were in Santa Fe Springs from seeing a sign, I wouldn't know what part of the county that was, or even where it w- related to anything else. And at the time... And this is only like five years ago. There, I couldn't find any kind of neighborhood maps or anything. So, I kind of started making them originally. Even the Immortal Thomas Guide is not neighborhood. It's, it's I've not never ne- seen it. I don't think so. No, I mean I haven't had a Thomas Guide in so long because they're so expensive and they were really helpful, but they got stolen a lot. And they're so thorough that it's almost confusing because it's every single street. Right. So Listeners, I, this I, is the big thick book that like people used to drive around with yeah. i've never actually yeah, used yeah. one maybe you can I say i had one on a passenger seat and it wasn't like a big map that you unfolded it was you know you'd you'd look to a part of town and then in the in the table of contents and then turn to the page and it, and then it would tell you like a grid like e4 okay this is where i'm going and then you know e5 might be an adjacent street you might have to flip a bunch of pages it wasn't it, it wasn't as user friendly. It was too much. Sounds like it was too much. Well, I know that they supposedly they used to put in like fake streets too to to stop people from stealing their information. And, Very helpful. Yeah, abusing their copyrights. I mean, it was it was great, but that yeah, they were valuable and people would steal them. And I, I had at least two that were stolen. I don't know by whom, but you know, presumably friends who were like this is worth more to me than him he has a better sense of the city I don't know I mean I don't know if I can slag AT&T but I have AT&T and I get no reception in I my, have at and in most like in this bar I get no reception so I would go to write about different neighborhoods and I would have in mind places I wanted to visit and I wouldn't 
I'd try to look up and see where they were, where the address was and how to get there, and my phone would say, no service. So I thought, I'll, I'll make a map and I'll kind of plot out and put the major streets. And plus, I just like the... I don't know. The, it, it, I, I, old medieval maps have always appealed to me that how, how they're so accurate about the area they represent... And then everything else is so fantastical. Terra incognita. Yeah, exactly. And and I was just looking. I mean, it, I, they don't know exactly what day he was born, but I, I I don't think. But Mercator's 500th birthday just passed a few days ago. Mm. And just looking at his maps and seeing like the the you know there might be a dragon over there, and Adam and Eve are on the the map of the Middle East. It's like this is paradise on earth and you know that's how everyone thinks of all very sort of so <laughs> soberly put on there yeah. Right? yeah i think so like not tongue-in-cheek at all but um i assume and, and on the other side of the ural mountains there might be cyclops and africa might be an island and there are all these inaccuracies and i not to uh insult native angelinos but i do find going around los angeles that a lot of people have very little sense of what surrounds them. They only know their area. And so I kind of wanted to reflect that. Like, these areas exist outside of this kingdom of my neighborhood. This is my neighborhood. Everything else is kind of vague. Now you've been here since 1999. I've been here since the summer. So, I, I mean, I've also noticed that with longtime Angelinos, people have been here 20, 30, 40 years, they, they will know their, their neighborhood they live in, they'll know the neighborhood they work in, they'll know the inside of their car. That'll be about it. What's, what's going on with that? I mean, there's 500 square miles, more diversity than arguably any other city in the world. What any keeps city them... in the world in any time. So, and as far as we know, any city in the universe. <laughs> just... well, I might as well just say, yeah. any city in the universe. Um, maybe that's what's scary about it, is... is the, the fear of uh, the unknown and, and diversity and I mean you know we're on the 20th anniversary of the riots I think people here seem really touchy about uh, diversity and, and, and talking about race and ethnicity um, and, and obviously I mean some of that's understandable uh, you have an, an ingrained history of determining where certain people can live in this city D- down to really, comp- you know, things like Catholics need to live there. Like legally, legally. Yeah, I mean, telling people where they can until live until it was challenged. Yeah, and then I, I don't know. I don't know if it was ever on the books, but there, from my understanding, that there was a suit in 1948 that ended effective segregation here because some black families had started to move into the mid city area. But because before that, it was like, well, Eastern Europeans have to live up on this side of the river. Cantor's was. Uh, founded in Boyle Heights. It was like Jews have to live over there, Chinese live there, Japanese live there, Asians aren't allowed to own property, so they have to live in residential hotels and areas like that around the Santa Fe Railroad and stuff like that. And um, But also I think the media just constantly encourages this feeling that Los Angeles is an incredibly dangerous place for anyone to step outside of their comfort zone and um, I mentioned this in one of my blog when I went to Compton I think it was like the day or two before I went, I saw on the History Channel a show about Compton, and they said it's a death sentence for anyone that's not black to set foot in Compton. And it was the first place I worked out here, and it's also not mostly black, it's mostly Latino, but... As is true with many neighborhoods (laughs) that are supposedly, oh, you can't go there, it's mostly whatever. And then it's like, no, just some Latino families. Yeah, yeah. And, and... It, it's I've, it's never been scary or threatening to me to go anywhere, and I and I actually have gotten comments from people sometimes that are angry that I haven't. A, a lot of times, it's, I, I get the sense that it's old timers that say, well, "I grew up in this neighborhood. It was great in the '70s and '80s. Now it's gone to pot. How dare you suggest that it's not as dangerous as it is?" They when, want to believe that it's gone to the dogs. I th- I think. Because they've moved, you know, they've moved to the Inland Empire, which is probably, you know, not that much different. And it, and the crime rates are down everywhere here. And I, I don't, like, I'm not paid, you know, I've been accused of being, like, a propagandizer for some... The Compton Chamber of Commerce <laughs> yeah, exactly. has, got, has got you in its pocket, a, yeah, believe they're, me. They're telling me, make our neighborhood seem less scary than it is. And then I go there, yeah. 
Uh, listeners, you can pull up Eric's expedition to Compton on the Gimme blog with his hand-drawn map from Pendersley and Sons and everything like that. But, you know, it's with, with Compton, it is a surprise. You, you roll down there. I don't know if you took the Blue Line train there. but you ro- Okay, so you took the train, you roll in on the train, and at least the first time I rolled into Compton that way, it was like, this is really kind of eerily nice, at least around the train station. It's... It's a surprise, and it makes me think that stereotypes hang on a little longer in Los Angeles than anywhere else, or s- nothing is defeating them, really? I think that's 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 probably true. I think that, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, it's such a media-saturated place, and, and these movies and, and music have life that lasts so long that... NWA will outlive us all, certainly. Right. And people forget. I mean, I think the first NWA album came out in, like, 87. I mean, it was a long time ago. When there was no Blue Line train yeah, even going there. exactly. Then. And, it, you know, but... So how many years ago is that? 35 years ago? I, we're looking more at 25, I think. 25 years ago? Okay, 25 years ago. So 20- yeah, If it's 35, I'm a little <laughs> older than I thought. So 25 years before 87, it was a much different place, too. I mean... Before the, I think it was around that time, yeah, before the 60s, like, Compton was mostly white. It was kind of the West Coast center of the country music scene. I don't know if people in the 80s were still necessarily thinking of it that way. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe those notions hang on longer now. I don't know. I mean, you, you go to places making maps, you know, besides Compton, Skid Row, downtown, mm-hmm. you go to, uh, East L.A., which some people still fear, but which is one of really the more the nicer neighborhoods I've been to in Los Angeles. You've been to, you, know, you go to, I forget if you've, have you gone to Westwood? I haven't done Westwood yet. I've gotten a lot of votes for West Side neighborhoods, but um, th- there are so many neighborhoods in the West Side. I think it's part of the problem. Like, none of them have really risen to the top that much besides Venice I did, uh, Little Osaka, and well, nobody's afraid of it. nobody's afraid of Venice and Little Osaka, but let's no, say yeah. you know Cypress Park, where 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 white families in cars are shot constantly. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Bill Clinton w- weighed in on that. Um, I I never know why people vote for the neighborhoods they vote for me to go because I I always go based on where the neighborhood with the most votes is at any time. And listeners might not know, yeah, you have a voting system yeah. always rolling, right? And people yeah. can vote. Eric should go here next, make a map here next, do the expedition here, and sort of adventure here next. And, you know, what's 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 popular with the voters? Where do they like to see you go? Um, at, at first, it was South L.A. neighborhoods, and that made me wonder, like, do our are, are, are people... Are they like, let's just send this guy into danger? I hope he gets killed. I hate him. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I tend to think the worst. But it, um, it's starting to be more... Like, I've done most of Northeast L.A. And, and from my first-hand experience, people in Northeast L.A. seem to me to be more than people from any other part of L.A. to be really proud of their region. And their region as a whole, beyond their neighborhood, like Eagle Rockers, Highland Park, Residence. For those who don't know, I mean, Pasadena is a well-known area yeah. of the Northeast. What else? It's a little bit outside. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, because it's in the San Gabriel Valley, on the edge of the San Gabriel Valley and La Crescenta Valley. But that's very, that could start a war. If, <laughs> sure. It's San Gabriel Valley, most people would say, completely. Between Pasadena and yeah. downtown, that's mm-hmm. the area you mean. Yeah. Yeah, it was, a, it's, it's an area with a lot of craftsmen that was at one time uh, settled by a lot of wealthy people when, when people started to move out of the downtown vicinity. Um, and then it kind of, became a poorer neighborhood and then it's going through a really obvious gentrification most of it at this point um so it's gone kind of up and down and up and down in terms of money i don't mean in terms of culture because it's always to me it's always been interesting um as all those neighborhoods on the east side have when you hear when you talk to somebody who's lived in los angeles even longer than you Mm -hmm. you know and they say they'll they'll say things like downtown well that that place is dead, right? Or, or Westwood, that's the place to go. Or we, we go to the beach or uh, Watts, Compton, stay out of there. I mean, does it ever seem strange to you now that you've actually explored all these places and people will voice kind of 20, 30-year-old opinions about where to go and where not to go? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, w- one of the first things I heard, well, I should say, before I came out here, most of my 
understanding of LA was informed by Hollywood. So all I really knew, I knew the places like Beverly Hills. I had a conception of what that's like. I had a conception of what Compton and Watts were like. Uh, I, the first place I stayed when I came out here was Chino, which I didn't have a conception of what it was like. And then it was on the OC. Even I don't know where Chino yeah. is. Well, it was on the OC. It was where the tough character came from. And it's where tough people live, apparently, That before they go to the OC. But... Um, or OC. No one really says the OC here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my, my friend from Chino, he said, never go south of the 10. And we visited his dad in Redondo Beach. Straight never. Yeah, yeah. You know, once I ventured south of the 10, I just didn't really think it was that bad. But I have people warn me a lot that live out here. And I do think it's strange. I, can, I, I don't want to blame or make fun of people for feeling fear about going other places. Because I really do think that it's so much the media that makes people scared of going places but because the only time you ever see anything south of the 10 is if there's a Martin Luther King Day parade or if there's um, you know like Al Sharpton speaking on the 20th anniversary of the riots it, it, it's it, it's so coded everything about south of the 10 and and then you go there anytime I mean I, I mostly go there because I get lost driving home from the LAX and just forget where I am because I get off the freeway because it's Jan and start taking surface streets and then all of a sudden I realize I'm in Southgate or something so they're great places to explore it's all great to explore I think when people say you know I never go south of the 10 and then they'll maybe pile on top of that I never go east of the river Mm -hmm. or east of Western Avenue or La Brea or wherever and then they say well, Los Angeles sucks. Mm-hmm. I'm not surprised they think that because mm-hmm. they've narrowed themselves down to 10 square miles absolutely. and often where not much happens, right? Right, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the first places I worked here and, and where I still work for is Amoeba and in Hollywood. And when we opened, because they're from the Bay, a lot of people came down from the Bay and it seemed like a lot of people settled in Hollywood and everyone, or at least a lot of people thought, well, Hollywood sucks. And, and by extension, L.A. sucks. And What was wrong with Hollywood to their mind? Or this, this area of Hollywood that Amoeba Music is in, this Sunset Vine type? Yeah. It's changed a lot. I mean, at the time, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessarily changed all for the better. It was a lot less developed. It was kind of an abandoned area by the arc light. It used to be a gravel parking lot uh, where Baja Fresh is. was just an empty lot, which I don't know which is better. Um, but... <laughs> It smells like urine, you know. There's a like it's a ho- place where a lot of homeless people congregate. I think ha- it was settled originally by prostitutes. Yeah, it, it, it definitely. There, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of the shops on Hollywood Boulevard seem oriented to prostitutes, like the clothing stores and stuff. Yeah, now that I think about it, most yeah, seem that way. It's ch- cheap suits for pimps and like stripper wear. And yeah, and- I walk down there, it's like <laughs> three suits, one hundred and sixty nine dollars right? with shoes. I saw, yeah, I saw an ad today on TV for a place on Hollywood where you can get three suits for $199 plus ties, plus shoes, plus belts. And I was like, how can they make any money? But As a purveyor of items for the discerning gentleman, <laughs> yeah. this must really bother you that there, there are these places. Uh, no, it's fine. I don't sell clothes, that, except for accessories. That, that's my niche. I'm, like, not competing with the pimp stores. <laughs> but, uh, I mean... It's taken... Hollywood and the West Side took more effort to uh, appreciate because the, the things they kind of offer you, I feel like, are the what are, to me, the least interesting stereotypes about L.A. And, and L.A. is kind of all about offering up stereotypical images of itself, and you have to actually go to work to, to defy those. But, the, it, but I don't think they're mostly true. And that's what made me love the city. What do you see as the East-West divide? People make so much of this, but I mean, what, what is the nature of what is West side versus what is East side? Is it illusory? Is it real? What is it? Well, to me, the, the East side is east of the L.A. River. And Northeast L.A. has kind of started to, it, it, I don't know how long it's been, but it seems like it has a, a growing, distinct identity that's sort of east of the L.A. River but north of the Arroyo Seco, which is like a, a smaller seasonal river, and the Monterey Hills. And um, But I don't think of like Silver Lake, Echo Park, Los Feliz, Hollywood, Midtown. Those to me are not the east side, but yet I've been to 
I, I went to a bar in uh, Westlake, which is named Westlake as a West Side answer to East Lake, which is what Lincoln Heights used to be. But it, but they had a night called East Side Mondays. So people's conceptions of what East Side and West Side are are definitely changing. And I read a, an, an interview with some or an article about a guy um, who whose nickname supposedly is the the father of the East Side Chic or something like that and. Everything he's done seemed uh, not on the east side to me. And now I, I just heard they're having an event called uh, Taste of the East Side, which I was actually really looking forward to because I think this neighborhood is, uh, not to insult this place, I haven't had the food since their new sous chef's been here. But uh, I don't really like very many of the restaurants around here. And I don't, you know, anyone that likes them, that's fine. But and Silver Lake specifically? Silver Lake Echo Park, I find to be like surprisingly there's a couple of good pizza places I don't want to single them out but uh, I, I'm surprised there isn't better Mexican food around here or better Vietnamese or anything but uh, if you go to the actual east side I feel like the food gets so much better and or at least to me appeals to my palate um, so I was kind of bummed that the taste of the east side was all places from Los Feliz Echo Park Silver Lake, stuff like that. Because I thought it was going to be like some kind of food ambassador program saying like... Because there, there are great places in Lincoln Heights, Boyle Heights, East L.A. Saying, come get this. We're hosting it in Barnesville Park in Los Feliz. But this is an actual taste of the east side. But it doesn't seem like it is. The culture in Los Angeles to experience seems very food-based at times. To me, you know, whether... You, when you can get... And Angelina, who doesn't usually leave their comfort zone to go someplace outside of it, it's often with food. Mm-hmm. And I find, I, I live in Koreatown, where there happens to be a lot of um, southern Mexican street food, as, as, as someone who's not been to Los Angeles might be surprised by. But, you know, you're, you're a vegetarian, mm-hmm. so does that affect your explorations here? You know, are there this, the, the vegetarian areas are the ones you're more inclined to return to? Or is there such a thing as a vegetarian-friendly area? Well, I would say... For the most part, there are very few vegetarian unfriendly places, even Koreatown. I mean, I think there, I've been to one Peruvian place and one Vietnamese place that had nothing vegetarian. But if you're going to Little Saigon, there are specifically vegetarian Vietnamese places. Um, if you go to like a Oaxacan restaurant, there are usually some vegetarian things. Korea t- Korean places, even. You I'm know. sure you've had a fine bibimbap every so yeah. often. You yeah. know, for my vegan <laughs> for my vegan friends, I've gotten them hooked on bibimbap right. whenever they visit. Bibimbap is demanded. Yeah, no, I mean, and and well, I think most places are, I found are, are really accommodating, even if there's nothing vegetarian on the menu. If you say you're vegetarian and you specify what that means and, and say not even fish or chicken or whatever, vegetarian exceptions are often are. Uh, Usually it doesn't matter. They'll just throw you together something. And I'm not super preoccupied with authenticity when I eat. I mean, it's mostly about what I'm hungry for. So, You know, a severe authenticity, Jones, can, can ruin one's experience of Los Angeles, can't it? I mean, whether in food or anything else, if you're dead set on authenticity, you, you'll run into some enjoyment problems here, mm-hmm. won't you? Not that nothing is authentic, but that if you, if you think that way, you sort of... What happens? Oh, yeah, I totally think you'll miss out on stuff because I, I think Southern California, of all the places I've lived, mm, I mean, maybe outside of the Ozarks, this is the, like, kitschiest place I've ever lived. Like, you know, there, there's a place in Alhambra that ha- it has uh, a Vietnamese uh, restaurant and I think a Chinese market, and it looks, it's supposed to look like it's the French Quarter. And I'm sure that pre- it goes back before... It was a more Asian neighborhood, but L.A. is full of stuff like that, where you've got super kitschy stuff. Olvera Street was basically invented. I mean, you know, the, the, there is a historical precedent there. Chinatown opened. It had an opening day. It was like, this is the new Chinatown. The old Chinatown got torn down. This is China on a small scale for you now. So... I don't have a problem with kitsch or inauthenticity. I kind of like it, as, as long as it appeals to me. I mean, the food doesn't always. I don't, I don't really like super Americanized Chinese food in general. 
my last roommate really did, and that was fine. And we, you know, we'd go to Hop Louis or something, and it's like, it smells different. Like, you go in there, and you're like, this smells like a kitschy Chinese place. It doesn't smell like you're in the San Gabriel Valley, you know? You've done, you've done a map on Chinatown, you've done a post on Chinatown, an expedition there. And it's fascinating because it seems like it's, I don't know if it's uniquely Los Angeles in this way, but you mentioned it was constructed, designed, it had an opening day. You know, come to Chinatown, it's open, as if it were a rail line or something or an amusement park. But now it's, it's decades on, it's sort of fallen on hard times and has once again become, it's sort of been returned into an actual place because it's no longer uh, really the center of anything. Does that make sense? Yeah, no. I think I think lots of places in LA get repurposed and I think I think that's one of the things I really like about the kitschy sort of Disneyland aspect of stuff here is that it it, it gains its own history after a while. Old World Village, I think in Huntington Beach, that place is you know, it was. I, I think it was built in like the '50s, and, and it's supposed to be like a Bavarian town, and and it's not a Bavarian town. And now it's something different than it was than it was in the '50s, but it's still appealing and interesting to me. I, I love the idea of like suburban ruins too. You know, right? It's in Los Angeles. I mean, it's 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 giant donut sculptures mm-hmm. made to sell donuts mm-hmm. that that have that are now chipped. It's. It's it's very basic apartment buildings made to look Hollywoodized mm-hmm. fifty years ago. It's it's Disneyland, but it's Disneyland that's fallen mm-hmm. that's by the wayside. fallen by the wayside. Yes, they know that that's that's where the action is here in a lot of ways, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, that just makes me think. One of my favorite places. I never ate there, but just one of my favorite places physically in in Thai Town was this old hot dog stand that had long ago become a Thai place and it's since out of business and I think torn down now but it had a big large hot dog sculpture on top I mean enormous and the relish had all kind of faded to gray and they'd hung a banner on it that said the name of the Thai restaurant and Thai town has a lot of that I mean there's a Taco Bell that got turned into a Thai barbecue and where the bell was is now you know the circ- that was removed and the circle's put in that says Thai barbecue but you can still tell it. it's a Taco Bell it's the Spanish esque in you know architecture and um, yeah I love I love the way that that stuff just continues on in, in a new form and it seems like for the people who come from other cities uh, the New Yorks or the Chicago's or London's or you know anywhere in Europe the that stuff really bothers them doesn't it like the architecture the the lack of consistency of the architecture I mean have you had to introduce Los Angeles to friends from other sort of glorious major cities who say how could you have a a hot dog sculpture on top of a Thai place yeah. that's not that, a real city doesn't have that I mean have you had this task of explaining this sort of thing yeah I, I have um, because when you try to give someone a tour of LA a lot of times taken in whole it can seem really visually uninteresting I mean there are so many band-aid bandage covered dingbats and they all I also don't know a dingbat is what just that like boxy two story rectangular apartment they're so common around here and you know a lot of times they displace something that to, to my aesthetic, would be much more attractive. In the name of modernization, they said, "Let's tear down this old Victorian right. and and put in this really hip modern dingbat." And and those things of age too. You've got like concrete rot and the fake stucco and stuff. Right. But as, as Rainer Bonham wrote, every every dingbat is different in the front, but in the back, they're all identical. <laughs> I could see that. Yeah, um, but LA has it doesn't. All, all, there is. I, I feel like it is one of the great architectural cities, and a lot of people would probably laugh at that. But it's just all so spread out. Although I will say, uh, like Highland Park is so has such a strong historic preservation overlay zone, and that's. I feel like historic preservation has become is a fairly new concept in LA, but it, but it's increasingly common. I mean, there's still things amazing buildings being torn down all the time. But from my understanding, the uh, Jack in the Box in Highland Park had to fit in with the, the, the overall vibe of Highland Park. So it's kind of built in this faux craftsman style with river rock foundations. 
And I love the idea of chains coming into a neighborhood and then having to conform to the neighborhood standards. Especially one of the likes of Jack in the Box. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jack and yeah, Jack for Jack in the Box should have you know a different look for when he's. This is the Highland Park Jack in the Box. He's Edwardian looking or something. But now, are you at all surprised that your maps made with made with colored paper and sharpies have captured people's imaginations around here? Absolutely, because I used to. I mean, I really thought of them. Not, not I, like I feel nervous about insulting people's taste if they like the maps. And like when I had my first art show, I was nervous about selling them as art because I felt I don't know I probably shouldn't admit that but I felt like I was perpetrating some like s- scam on people or something but people every are, artist may feel that though. I know yeah I guess I just need to embrace the Malcolm McLaren side and be like no this is uh, this is what art is it's self promotion but uh, people liked them and, and the, the very first one I sold I had thrown into the recycling bin and then the, uh, an art gallery owner expressed interest in showing them so I fished it out of the trash and someone bought it, and it had stains on it, and people liked the stains. <laughs> Before that moment, they were just for you, then. They were for your own I would, guidance. I would... I At first, they were for my guidance, and then I started combining them with the blogs about neighborhoods and scanning them for that. And then when I was done scanning them, I would just set them aside or throw them in a pile of paper somewhere. But then, eventually, people... It, it seems like people are much more interested in just the maps themselves than what I actually have to say about the neighborhoods. So... Um, yeah. You do fairly intensive, in-depth write-ups of these neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have the area, then each neighborhood listed out, and population statistics. What what kind of... What what form of research really fascinates you when you are figuring out a neighborhood? I mean, you, you talk a lot about what kind of people are there, where they're from, but what what tells you the most, you personally, about how a neighborhood is? Uh, I, I am fascinated by... Um the, the ethnic diversity of LA and I think that I mean I, ha- I, I take a strong issue with the people that divide LA or, or just ethnicity to along uh, the, the way that a lot of people divide it like I, I think that white neighborhoods can be as ethnic as any other neighborhood you know if it's an ex- you dare to say that white can have white also has different ethni- ethnicities yeah, within it right i mean you know i'm like germanic and anglo which is like you know what a, a lot of people think of just what as not ethnic or not being of color but it is i mean it, it seems no less distinct or, or interesting to me than a neighborhood that's overwhelmingly Armenian, which to me, I mean, along my understanding of race, which, you know, acknowledging that it's a construction, like, I still think of Armenians and Persians as white and Jews, and there are Jewish neighborhoods, and, and there, I was in some neighborhood in uh, northwest LA where they said it was, uh, I think the predominant ethnicity was Canadian Americans, which... Canadian Americans? <laughs> what, what neighborhood was that? I think it was Lake Hughes or Elizabeth Lake, and it was because even that I don't think of as an ethnicity. I mean, it's a country of origin, but Canada is a very multi-ethnic society compared to a place like Korea, where it's ninety-eight percent Korean. So I don't know. I I, th- I think there are so many different layers of ways that neighborhoods can be identified with like the the inhabitants um but then it's not it's not just about ethnicity and stuff i mean food i think being such a big part is a big indicator and a big source of identity and a lot of la neighborhoods begin with um a a restaurant or a market i mean that's how koreatown started that's how little bangladesh started you know people move in they open a grocery store and then a restaurant and then more people come from that country on student visas. More people start staying. So I, I think here it is very tied to uh, the migration. And, you know, mo- most of the official ethnic enclaves here are Asian neighborhoods, which makes sense because we're on the Pacific Rim. And there aren't very many official Latino neighborhoods because I feel like the presence is so overwhelming and so much more assimilated. I mean, most neighborhoods, even if it's a neighborhood that's officially designated like a Latino or even like little Ethiopia, I don't know that. I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's mostly Latino. It's like mostly Latino almost everywhere. 
the whole the whole sort of fact that it started as Mexico as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it makes you think the baseline is Latino here, yeah. and everything else is, you know, even if it's white, it's it's different than it started out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, absolutely. There's that it kind of cliched saying that we didn't cross the border; the border crossed mm-hmm. us. That you hear from Mexicans, which is true. I mean, but. There were always people crossing the border here. I mean, it's it's the, the, this hemisphere. I feel like is all about migration. I mean, it used to be Tongva and Chumash here. The Aztecs, the latest consensus or near consensus seems to be that they came from around Salton Sea and migrated to Mexico. And then you get Mexicans coming back. The Spanish, like it, I mean, it's it's constantly rewriting in terms of that. Now, whether as simply a, a resident here or a business owner or an explorer of Los Angeles, what has what have all, the, all has all this map making, all this scrutinizing, and all these expeditions? What have they taught you about the ways the the ways to use Los Angeles that are sort of richer than maybe uh, the default human impulse would be for how to live here? I think, I mean, to me, I just, I just think, I, I really think it's the best way to experience LA is to just go somewhere that you don't know. And I mean, the first map I made was of Southeast LA because I felt like I had almost no understanding of any of that. I'd, I'd been to Bell Gardens and Downey, and but I didn't, you know, I just thought, well, I'm gonna go and like walk around, get out of your car. Take, take public transportation there <laughs> if possible, but but to just get out and explore and and you have to go inside places too because so much of it physically does not indicate what it actually is. Uh, it's all you pop into a market, get outside your comfort zone for sure because there are so many extremely vibrant cultures here and subcultures and like if there's something smaller than subcultures, micro subcultures or something. Th- they're they're really flourishing and really defined and really interesting and and people live their whole lives here and have no idea that these things are happening and and their their conceptions of of places are so rooted in in again not to insult people but ignorance i mean it's just like they have no idea what to expect of that place so they're like oh well that that it, isn't Orange County all really rich, you know? And then you go to Westminster, and it's incredibly Vietnamese. And then you go to a Vietnamese party, and everyone's listening to '80s German music, and you're like, "Who? You would have never known that unless you'd like driven at least with your windows down <laughs> and, and like gotten out and talked to people." Um, what what got you to get out of the car at least when you were driving around or you know what was well, I, I I credit a lot of it to my mom who's an anthropologist so she was always interested in other cultures but uh, and, and I I think I just I, I'm I've always been interested in things that are different and things that are different from what I know and I guess that's sort of like the adventure side of me too but um. When I first came out here, it was, it was actually to drive a friend home from college who went to school with me, and I didn't really... I, w- I wasn't especially interested in Los Angeles, and just based on the stereotypes, I had no interest in coming here. He was in Chino, and I had friends that lived in Santa Monica, so I was driving back and forth a lot in a very unreliable 1988 Ford Taurus, and it, it broke down in East L.A., and... I remember feeling incredibly out of my element because none of the mechanics spoke English at all. So we had to go to a barber shop where there was a guy getting his hair cut that spoke English. And then also, you know, driving across the San Gabriel Valley, you could see at night all these signs written in Chinese. I'd kind of had two friends give me their tours of L.A. One was sort of the official Walk of Fame, Capitol Records building, errands. Um, you kind of feel sorry for people when they when you know that they're getting that as their image of mm-hmm. Los Angeles, right? When they visit and they see they see Sunset Boulevard, they see Hollywood Boulevard and the beach, they come away thinking that's what this is. You, that feels a little bit uh, shame, huh? I think so, and I think a lot of times they seem kind of disappointed. I got a ride back. So would I be? Yeah. Well, it, I mean, and, and some people aren't, and, and you know, some people are excited by a star with somebody's name on it. But or a guy in a baggy Spider-Man right, costume. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. The superheroes at Hollywood and Highland. Yeah. But um, 
I, I got a ride back with a sh- from a shuttle from LAX once, and uh, I just had the sense that th- this couple had probably been on a game show and won like a fabulous two night stay in downtown Hollywood, and they seemed horrified, you know. And I would be horrified too <laughs> if I had just gotten off the plane and they're like, "This is this is your glamorous vacation," right. you know. There's a place that sells cell phone cases and postcards. <laughs> Um, but my other friend gave me a tour, and his tour was... I, I think he just kind of knew what my interests already were a little bit more. So I remember we went to Chinatown, little Tokyo, little Ethiopia. We skipped uh, Koreatown, I remember. Oh, that's too bad. As a Koreatown resident, I can right. say, too bad. Well, in the time that it took to drive through Koreatown and seeing all these signs in Hangul, I was like, what's, what's this area? And he's like, this is Koreatown. It's, you know, it's dirty or scummy so even people that have there's nothing going on here forget yeah, it he, I mean even people that have are open to some things about LA are usually closed off about other things but so I, I actually when I was still in Chino I, I took like a day trip to Koreatown I, I was like I'm gonna make a little vacation of this and I got a souvenir I went to the uh, Koreatown Galleria I think and one uh, of the top ten malls in <laughs> yeah, Koreatown in yeah. fact absolutely I and mean, like you know just spent a lot of time in this like four story mall and and just taking it in because I don't I don't know I guess I don't think that um any one part of LA is necessarily more interesting than another it just you know one area might appear on the surface obviously more interesting and then but other neighborhoods are really interesting that physically are really uninteresting mm. there there's a sense that what you see sort of on the surface of a neighborhood. You know, it's like going on that Blue Line train down through the south of Los Angeles, seeing this vast expanse, what looks like a bunch of little houses, little houses for what seems like hundreds of miles. Uh, You'd never be able to guess, would you, that you can actually do stuff there. You know, I can either move here or I can keep passing through. But no, there's there's more to it. But it it takes an almost like... Like, you have to take one of those forked sticks and, like, point it at the ground and see yeah. where the things are. You know, that's... How do you... How do you train yourself to know where, where even to turn your head to find what's interesting? Well, that, that's true. Because, I, I mean, I remember the first time I took the blue line, Part, you know, parts of it you can really see a vast expanse of houses and, you know... You're lucky a factory. Right. Maybe some liquor stores. Well, back when I first took it, some VHS rental places. I think those are all gone now. Yeah, I had, I mean, I had, I was shocked at how expansive it was. Like how, it seems like it's like 50% of the city almost, you know. Um, and, and, but that's part of the reason I had the idea, because about doing the neighborhood blog and letting people vote to decide where I would go, because at first I started going, I think maybe the first five or so, I would go places with the, the girl I was dating at the time and, and it would be on errands and then I thought well these are always there's something interesting about everywhere and I'm and I'm drawn if someone says don't go to that neighborhood it sucks there's nothing there then I'm immediately like oh okay I'm gonna uncover it <laughs> which is why I still want to go to Houston <laughs> because everyone I've heard there's always nothing tells there. me how awful Houston is I'm like it's the fourth largest city in the country though there's gotta be stuff there so you know we'd go to Montebello and Granada Hills and stuff and I was like yeah people people write these places off but th- there are interesting things about them there's the mall where back to the future where the terrorists the Libyan terrorists pursued you know uh Michael J. Fox. These movie sites are, are a big part of a lot of your <laughs> write-ups as well. They're everywhere, yeah. And, the, and that, that's, I mean, that's part of how I tried to please my bosses with the idea because there, I think there was a little bit of concern at first. What does this actually have to do with Amoeba? And I was like, well, I'm, ta- I'm going to talk about, you know, what film was shot there, what scene was shot there. You know how we sell DVDs, right? Right, well. right. And, and at, almost every neighborhood in L.A. has... A, a musician history or a fil- some kind of film history, and and then I just thought I didn't I didn't want to be biased and just go places where I had to go for errands or or just go places that appealed to me. So that's why I decided I'll just try to come up with a and it's growing the list of neighborhoods and say I'll go wherever the most votes are for. And the first neighborhood I went to after that was Morningside Circle, which is a very small neighborhood in South LA that had no film history that I could uncover and no music history 
of any uh, that I could find, but it was it was still fun. I mean, it was just kind of thrilling to be somewhere. I mean, people came up to me immediately and were like, the, it, I, I think people in L.A. are so used to, they can really easily tell when you're not from their neighborhood, even if they can't necessarily tell. I mean, sometimes it's skin color, but a lot of times you can, I mean, I've seen West Siders in Echo Park and asked them where they're from, and they've said, Brentwood, you know, we're coming over because we read that this is a really hip bar in the weekly, and then, but, uh, so, yeah, people were coming up to me and asking me, what are you doing in this neighborhood? What are you writing about? And it wasn't in an aggressive way, and then people were, wanted me to include and talk about what they did, and talk about their neighborhood and tell me about what they liked about it and stuff so i like that idea that it's i put it in the hands of the 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 democracy like, right. you tell me where to go well where do you hope these people send you for the next pendersley and sons mm-hmm. cartographical uh, exploration i mean where do you where do you think it'd be really nice if they just voted this place up because it's been seen i'm kind of fascinated yeah there definitely are those places that i think are fascinating to me right off the bat that I would like to go to. Like, I know in San Pedro, there's a place called Sunken City, where a residential neighborhood fell into the bay. Oh. And, uh, in I think it's in Pacific Palisades, there's, in, in Rustic Canyon, there's an, a compound built by some Nazi sympathizers for Hitler in case he ever needed to, you know, come to America and hang sure. out. <laughs> Live on the West Coast. Be prepared. Right, yeah. Um... So, so there are these places I have in mind, but I, I also, at the same time, I feel like it's it's more fun to go to places where I have no expectations and and don't e- really... Yeah, the less expectation I have about a neighborhood, it's almost more fun. And the less I can find about it online, the more fun it is. Little Bangladesh, I knew almost nothing about and could find nothing about. And I just walked into a market, and a guy asked if he could help me. And I said, well, I've been voted to write about this neighborhood, Little Bangladesh. Am I in it? You know? <laughs> he's Bengali. And then he's like, oh, you need to talk to these guys. And there's like, four people sitting at a table, and they just told me their stories. And they recounted, like, their oral history of the community in in the neighborhood. And uh, and I asked them questions, and I thought, this, this is much more fun to me than something like... I mean, it's not because places like Pasadena and Long Beach aren't amazing too, but there's there's so much work because they're so documented. Yeah. People are going to expect you to include every you know every time I leave something out about something that's well documented. People say, "Oh, you forgot this." I'm like, I didn't forget. Come that. the emails. I just I can't I can't put everything. You know, I've reached the limit in the memory of a blog before where it's like you can't save any more information and I don't want to make it so long that no one wants to read it because I know that you know it, it's I mean I'm, I don't have the longest attention span if I see something no matter how if it's too thorough I just I, I'm like pick and choose tell me what's interesting if I'm more interested I'll delve deeper but I, I try not to just overwhelm people with facts I've been speaking with Eric Brightwell, purveyor of purveyor of luxury goods, the luxury and craft goods, lest we forget. Uh, at Brightwell, his shop here in Silver Lake, and as well the proprietor of Pendersley and Sons Cartography, mapping the neighborhoods of Los Angeles one by one. You can see the results on the Ami blog at Amoeba Music's website. Eric, thanks so much for taking the time tonight. Thank you so much. It's an honor. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with all of the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to the people backing this season, including Aidan Nolman, Andy Cooney, Ben Bartley, Brian J. Dell, Doubt Us Artwork, Greg Bigelow, Greg Linster, Henry Coronan, Humberto Grant, James Faber, Jonathan McKelmont, Mark Larson, Matt Warren, Mia Muratori, Nicholas Croft, Paul Doyle, Ray McGuire, Rob Montz, Robert Foley, Roberto Medri, Samuel Hansen, Sean Dudley, Small Demons, Stephen Inglaze, Steve Himmer, TSD, and Wayne Wright.